I'm going to be the moderator for today's session. Um, before we start, I want to open it up and say that we will have a question and answer session after the presentation. Please enter your questions for our presenters in the chat box. This session is closed captioning enabled. Please click on the closed caption button in your Zoom toolbar and choose the option to show the live transcript. Additionally, for those who are visually impaired, the session is compatible with NVDA, JAWS, VoiceOver, and Android TalkBack screen readers. So I am very excited to introduce our wonderful speaker. Rafael Clemente is the Executive Director of the West Palm Beach Downtown Development Authority, or DDA. He joined the DDA team in January of 2006, bringing with him a multidisciplinary background and local knowledge. Since being named Executive Director, Rafael has guided the DDA to some noteworthy successes. These include the formation of the West Palm Beach Arts and Entertainment District, the recruitment of dozens of new businesses to the downtown area, the creation of the first office of public life in North America, and most recently spearheading local efforts to address the impacts of COVID-19. Rafael holds a master's degree in urban planning from Florida Atlantic University's Center for Urban and Environmental Solutions, and he is a member of the International Downtown Association Board of Directors. I'm very excited to let him uh, kick off the presentation and speak. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, welcome, everyone. I see in our uh, in the list of participants some friends out there, some colleagues I've known for a long time. So thanks for joining us. Um, typical of me, I was editing on the on the fly right up until the last moment uh, before we logged on to this presentation. So I added our little subtitle here um, that I thought captured it: um, how we got it wrong, or how you can create <clears throat> create a multimodal district despite what you've been told. Um, so uh, I, I always like to start talking about downtown West Palm Beach um, with the original plan. And John Nolan, uh, fairly well-known town planner and Phil Foster uh, partnered together, two names you might know, particularly Phil Foster, if you're a local Phil Foster Park, <clears throat> developed West Palm's first plan in the 1920s and their plan envisioned a city um, with a waterfront, with uh, water to the west of its urban center, which is what we know as our Clear Lakes, and with all the challenges that would come as growth happened. Um, nobody really could see into the future to, to 2021, but 100 years ago, this plan was a pretty good plan. And for the most part, um, it has come to be. Uh, our urban center has grown up to be a fairly dense mid-sized uh, mid downtown area, the eight, roughly eight miles of the city from north to south. And considering what we have east of I-95 um, is fairly well connected uh, and relatively speaking, a walkable transit capable area. Um, just a quick bit of stats on downtown West Palm Beach today. Um, we're roughly 700, almost 800 acres, um, right in the center of uh, a county with one and a half million people in a city with 110,000 uh, residents. Um, downtown, we have, we're approaching 8,000 residential units, over 1,000 hotel rooms, and millions of square feet of uh, non-residential uses in downtown West Palm, Clematis Street, right in the heart of it all. So historically, uh, and I, and I, I feel like we should talk about where we were, where we went to, and then how we got to where we are today. So downtown was um, a, a thriving, bustling, growing city. Our, our main street at Clamata Street had all the bells and whistles of a main street in the 20s, 30s, 40s. We even had the iconic five and dime that was on all of America's main streets. Uh, F.W. Woolworth's right here on Clematis Street at 314 Clematis. Um, but what we didn't have was a lot of residential population. And as our area continued to grow, the need to accommodate the motor vehicle grew. Um, this you can see from looking at the cars, people might guess better than me, but maybe in the late 50s or early 60s, um, our main street at Clematis, three lanes, one way eastbound, parking on both sides, no shade, uh, five foot wide sidewalks. But you can see who's here. JC Penney uh, here, the big vertical sign in the distance, Belks, a large department store, 
Anthony's here, Walgreens here on the corner, which is now Duffy's. This is Olive Avenue at the cross section. Um, and you can see, interestingly, the Barnes Dance crosswalk that allowed people to cross a diagonal pattern anywhere around across the street when traffic had a red light. But the suburbs were growing. Um, the area west of what is, uh, you know, our traditional downtown area, our, our eastern edge here, the suburbs were growing. That American dream of your own space to sprawl out, a two-car garage, was definitely a very, very big part of the appeal of South Florida to people who were moving here from other places. And growth happened rapidly, particularly in the post-war years. As the suburbs grew, so did the need to service those people in an area closer to them. Palm Beach Mall opened just before Halloween in 1967, just in time for the horror show to start of the exodus of all of our uh, downtown shops and businesses. As you see, Woolworths went straight from Clematis to the mall, as did benchmark retailers that were traditionally on main streets in America, including ours, Burdines with their first location right here across the street from me at 301 Clematis. And then a few years later, about a decade later, they opened a flagship store uh, where our city hall and library now stands at 401 Clematis Street uh, in 1954. By 1967, Burdines had gone to the mall and left downtown West Palm Beach. And shortly thereafter, the decline, the rapid decline of downtown started. You can see this building, as I showed you in an earlier photograph, was J.C. Penney. That sign is no longer there. This here on the corner was Walgreens, no longer there. And slowly but surely, uh, the lifeblood of downtown, the money, the consumer dollars, and the visitors that kept this place alive faded. We had a downtown in decline because why invest in your downtown when you can invest in plants and lighting and water features inside the mall? Um, malls boomed. I, I remember going to the mall as a kid. I loved it. It was great. It was exciting. And, and the strip mall or the big inside mall, Simon Properties, um, famous for their malls, um, really boomed. Um, but our traditional urban centers, our sub-districts like Northwood Village, all suffered uh, and went downhill as a result. Palm Beach Mall opened 1967, Town Center Mall in 1980, Boynton Beach Mall in 1985, Gardens 88, Wellington Green, 2001. Most recently, we know the Palm Beach Outlets has opened. The old Palm Beach Mall got bulldozed, that site got scraped clean, and that mall reopened. While all that happened, every one of those was a little cut to our urban districts, in, including downtown West Palm. This is the area that is now City Place in these two photographs. That's the Hilton I'm sorry, the Marriott, that's Okeechobee Boulevard. You can see Clear Lake in the distance. Everything east of that is now City Place, not the city we recognize today at all. In fact, headlines ran about the destruction of downtown, the fabric of downtown, um, with this headline from 1989, wreckers and arsonists crumble the city's past. Um, in fact, this little paragraph here, an estimated 65 fires have burned vacant buildings in the area this year. Amazing, right? But it did set the stage for renewal. Um, this picture tells a very uh, powerful story. And if you take a look at this picture, just focus your eyes on everything that is not a building. And it is all dedicated to the single occupant vehicle. Every street, this is Olive Avenue. It's three lanes, one way north. Dixie Highway, three, lines, one, three lanes, one way south. And every cross street, Daytura, Ivernia, Fern, et cetera, were three lanes. Every one of these roads was a three lane road because the prevailing uh, approach to uh, design and engineering was that we had to move as many cars in and out of our downtown district as fast as we could. Definitely a lot of people come in here to work every day, but when they left, this is what they left. They left a place of disinvestment um, without any character at all. Uh, this is in the probably mid or late 80s. This is Clematis Street looking west. This is now CVS. This was the Burdines building is now City Hall and the library. Um, but a place that is um, a 
uh, the epitome of a downtown in decline. A very bold vision was created. And here's where we get to that renewal part. Um, in, the, in the early 90s, um, city leadership, uh, property owners, uh, residents of the, of the city in general, all came together and coalesced around the idea of revitalizing our urban center. And some visionary plans were put in place for that, um, including the built environment, streetscape enhancements to the physical place, and policy uh, changes that were made to allow the density and development pattern necessary for an urban place to thrive. These two documents, the, the, the original streetscape that was done in the 90s, it took us from three lanes down to two and restored the traditional Main Street configuration of Clematis. And the downtown master plan document um, put into print uh, in December of 1995 um, Andres Duani, Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, and others worked on that plan, and it was truly a visionary plan, continues to influence downtown today. In conjunction with that plan, we had to address motor vehicle traffic because at the time and to this day, traffic for performance standards, level of service, um, strongly influenced how and what you could develop. So this document, the Transportation Concurrency Exception Area, this plan was drafted in 1997, made this very bold statement. Um, I won't read it to you, but words jump out. The city cannot simultaneously achieve livability, sustainability, and concurrency, meaning traffic and currency, in downtown West Palm Beach. So the city, the stakeholder group here, appealed to the state and the county to free them from level of service standards and allow them to take a different approach. To, to do that, they had to prove, or at least attempt to prove that they could address what the forecasted traffic would be, the trip generation rates based on all the development they wanted to do, that we wanted to do here. Uh, and we, and the, the, for, the forecast year, the threshold year was 2015. And if you look at some of these numbers, four lane, divided highway, level of service D, 31,000 vehicles a day, they made a bunch of predictions about what traffic would be if development happened per the plan by this particular year. The beauty is now we have data to see really what happened over that period of time. The approach, and we're gonna get back to that. So remember that slide. The approach that we took here, and this is sort of a napkin sketch of how we saved the world uh, from a, um, a uh, overzealous engineering approach, traditional, this is where we came from, traffic engineering, and let's, they tell us how we do everything. And I'm not slamming traffic engineers at all. I'm suggesting that we need to invert that cone and study and determine who we wanna be and what we wanna be and how we wanna live our lives, and then give it to the engineers and say, this is what we want you to build for us. I really believe that traffic engineers, uh, particularly now, can be the heroes of revitalizing our places, our urban places our neighborhoods and make them, making them work much better for people and, and drivers of, of automobiles, uh, pedestrians, bicyclists, et cetera, all modes. The principles that guided the plan and all of the uh, approaches that were taken were to, uh, to improve the public realm and the private realm simultaneously. The built form, focusing on building placement, how the buildings address the street, were there active uses, was it a mixed use place, and then the public realm, parks, sidewalks, streetscapes, thinking of streets as places is a critical element uh, to making a good urban district. So the idea of making places for people in your urban place, in your urban, down, in your urban district. Uh, I like to call this the magic triangle. When we think about that dual-sided approach of public and private realm, at the intersection of that triangle, that's where those two places meet the public sector and the private sector come together at this edge or the opportunity zone. This is where I focus most of my efforts as the director of the DDA is in this magic triangle. The first two stories of the building out to the motor vehicle lane. How good can we make that space is the question we have to ask ourselves. Today we did a, a bike tour of downtown and we focused entirely on this, this realm here. In the plan document, 
and in the guiding principles and in the development of staff, uh, in the communication with our stakeholder group, we put at the center of all of that, the idea of creating a good, healthy, vibrant, attractive place. I love this, this uh, picture. This is a, actually a poster, an image from Project for Public Spaces. And it has place in the middle of it, like a bullseye, maybe not necessarily think of this as yes, a geographic place, but also the place as you think of the place, your perception of the place. If you can use these words to describe your place, this green ring around the center of bullseye. Um, and these are, the, these are the things we're trying to achieve. These are the measurables. How do we measure number of women and children, social networks, local business ownership, et cetera. But if people use these words on the left-hand slide of this slide to describe your place, you have done well. If they don't use those words, you have work to do. So we set about trying to achieve those outcomes, charming, fun, inviting, welcoming, celebratory, et cetera, with a bunch of strategic investments in the public realm, most of them in that magic triangle space. And of course, enabling the private sector to do the vertical development to create the density necessary to put people on the street here. And this was a series of trial and error, projects, programs, tests, interventions. Um, something we started doing in downtown in about 2007 was parking day. Remember the slide of those roads that are three lanes, one way all over downtown? We started exploring ways we could chip away at all that automobile space and reclaim some of it for people. Uh, parking day and then eventually evolved into our parklet program. Um, set the stage for what has become a curbless street and more curbless streets coming in the, in the downtown area because it, it makes a seamless connection from building to building that gives everyone an opportunity and we'll, we'll talk about that. But these little experiments were really important at starting the conversation with leadership and with our community and stakeholders. We also did a lot of different, uh, we brought a lot of different ideas to the table. Um, sometimes bringing in the proverbial out of town expert um, to help us present these ideas. Jeff Speck, Gell Architects, our mobility plan, a parking study, all of these helped us lay the foundation for change by educating our community and getting the stakeholder group to understand that investments in the public realm would turn into enhanced property values, enhanced quality of life, enhanced business revenues, if we could make the place a place people wanted to be, not just that they wanted to come to and then leave right away. We involved our community. We pulled everybody together, both in the public realm and in boardrooms, meeting rooms, public hearings, et cetera get people around the table and not just your usual suspects like chamber, DDA board, et cetera, but go and talk to people where they are. Go engage them on the street. I love this slide here with Allison Justice uh, and some of the team here at the green market asking people what they wanted to see. What we came to was a community engagement process to come up with a design plan. And this is just our latest version. And we've gotten better and better and better at this about engaging our community. So we asked a bunch of questions. What do you want to see in your community? Uh, how do you want to uh, experience the public realm in your city? Wider sidewalks, we heard, shade trees we want. We want better materials. We want the surfaces, the seating, the lighting to be high quality. We want traffic to slow down. We heard that all over and over and over again. In fact, shade and slower traffic were top of the list. And we got to these ideas with design outcomes. So don't ask people what you want, what they want, and then not do it. That's the worst thing you can do from a public engagement perspective. They'll never engage again. So we put those requests into a list and came up with design solutions, large shade trees, suspend, suspended pavement sections, and stabilized soil to let those shade trees grow. These big boxes are made to let roots expand under the sidewalk. Uh, better pavement, higher in materials, seating, valley gutters to control uh, storm water so it doesn't flow up the sidewalk when we have those curbless streets. All these things were built into the plan. Um, obviously we came up with a budget to fund them and we went about executing it. So that's the, that's the built environment piece. The most important piece um, 
the most important uh, uh, approach that we can take isn't just the built environment. It is how we formulate our land use plan and what we allow to happen within um, a, a district. So within this, this uh, little box, the frame around the image of downtown, this aerial image of downtown, that's about one square mile, roughly one square mile. In that one square mile, we know we have thousands of residents, over a thousand hotel rooms, millions of square feet of non-residential use, two transit, two, two rail stations, a bus station, all kinds of things happening there. Looking at the suburban environment, it would be very difficult to achieve at a low density land use pattern outcomes that really achieve livability, walkability, et cetera. In, this, in that same one mile, one square mile roughly, um, this is a PUD typical uh, of Western uh, Palm Beach County or Western Broward County. Uh, and in this PUD, you have about the same number of residential units as you would have in two of over a dozen condo buildings in downtown. Imagine if you took a condominium and like a deck of cards, unstacked it and spread it out on a table. That's what you, that's what you get. When you spread that stuff out thin, you cannot achieve outcomes that support livability, walkability, sustainability, et cetera, all the abilities. <laughs> um, and looking at what, what you get, um, these are, this is a study done for, for um, um, uh, a density study done to determine what types of transit services would be most supported in the downtown area. This blow up is that little square, it's Palm Beach County zoomed out. And in this little blow up on the left side of the screen, density supportive of transit systems, much of downtown on a per people per acre basis, much of downtown is at a threshold that could even support perhaps light rail. Definitely trolley service, the circulator in downtown uh, carries close to a half million people a year. Um, Brightline, Tri-Rail, Pontran, all service the downtown district. This density supports that and demands it, in fact. Um, mode split. So what have we seen? What has happened with all these investments over time? This is from 20, maybe 2018, 2017, 2018. Commute mode share. When people were asked how they got downtown in a survey um, over a period of time in different locations, in downtown West Palm Beach, 20% of people said they used public transportation, walked or biked. Others said they did something else, carpool, taxi, worked at home. But you can see a significant chunk of people in downtown West Palm Beach got to work without the use of a private vehicle. I'm most, I'm most excited about this, um, the far right end of that little graph. In the city of West Palm Beach, it goes down to 8%, less than half. And then in Palm Beach County overall, much less the walk and bike. And I can tell you from experience uh, and from uh, 20 years of working in the field of urban planning and transportation planning in Palm Beach County, that 5% countywide is probably underreported but it's also probably a population that does not have the, op the opportunity or the uh, privilege of owning and operating a car. So walking and biking to where they go or riding transit is their only option. Um, that is not a good position to be in for anyone. It's something that we should consider as we talk about how we improve our transportation system. So getting back to those forecasts and sort of my enticing title of how we got it wrong Here's how we got it wrong. The forecasts all greatly inflated the number of trips that would be generated by the amount of development within the downtown district per that master plan that was drafted in 1995. So Okeechobee Boulevard uh, between Dixie Highway and Tamarind Avenue, basically when you enter downtown until you get to Dixie, forecast trips, 73,000. Actual trips today, 49,000. Way off, way off. Historic daily traffic volumes throughout downtown, and I had data going back beyond this and later than this, but this was a convenient slide to have. Everything has gone down between 2005 and 2014, despite the amount of development. And you say, well, there's gridlock. I see traffic 
at peak hour. Yes, absolutely. We do have traffic at peak hour. But if you don't have traffic at peak hour, you have nothing going on in your place. People have to get there. People have to drive in. We have to move vehicles. So traffic is a indicator of a successful place in many ways. Um, whether or not people view it that way is a different story. Bicycle parking counts. This was uh, earlier this year, pre-COVID. I walked around uh, on, on various days in downtown AM and PM peak hour. And you can see on average um, in the morning and in the afternoons, uh, there's about 100 bikes parked. This is just in the Clematis corridor, by the way. This is not even close to downtown wide. Um, this is in the Clematis corridor in an area that is predominantly served by the Banyan garage. And 100, if those bikes were turned magically into cars, 100 cars is one entire floor roughly of the Banyan garage. So when we want to address our parking issues, multimodal, creating a better environment for multimodal transportation is key to that. And most of the people whose bicycles they are, these are parked in the Clematis corridor are coming to work in downtown. And to give you a little bit of an indication, a place like Duffy's on Clematis or a place like Rocco's on Clematis through their entire day-to-day uh, -day shift over a week, um, you know, they open at say 11 a.m. and they close at 2 a.m. They employ about 75 people. 75 people work for Rocco's Tacos in downtown West Palm Beach. Some of them are the chef, um, the, the, bar, the bartenders, the hostess. A lot of them are waiters, waitresses, bar backs, bus boys, prep, prep cooks, et cetera. A very broad range of income levels and allowing people to not pay that $10 parking fee every day puts a lot more money in their pocket. Um, how can we do better? And this is an important conversation to have considering the audience uh, on this session. Um, I, I asked a question earlier this year of Palm Beach County's uh, impact fee office. If we were to build new office, if we were to build a brand new 5,000 square foot office in downtown, what would the roadway impact fee be based on the trip generation rates? So the answer I got from the, uh, uh, man the manager of the growth management program and traffic said there are two trip generation rates and the dividing line is 5,000 square feet. From a 5,000 square foot office space, the net daily trips will be 73 trips. And when I asked how many of those, what type of offset or credit was given for a incredibly multi multimodal walkable place, like almost none. So the impact fee would be for a new 5,000 square foot office, the roadway impact fee only, would be seven, almost $18,000. In Palm Beach County, the impact fee ordinance mandates that that $17,745 impact fee can only be used on new asphalt. It cannot be used on a transit shelter, uh, a bike rack. It cannot be used to increase capacity of moving people in an urban place other than new asphalt. And we know we are not going to build a new lane anywhere in downtown West Palm Beach because that would require us to eminent domain property or bulldoze trees or something. It's antithetical to the idea of urban infill. So I did a little digging. The DDA office, uh, we're 5,200 square feet. There are eight, the eight of us that work here. We have 16 car trips a day, way less than 73. Um, about 18 walk trips. A lot of those are uh, going to lunch, going to coffee, going to city hall for a meeting. They're not car trips, but the way they're forecast in the county's impact fee ordinance and trip generation table is that any trip is a car trip. Uh, 6,000 square foot office space with 24 employees, a hedge fund uh, at 200 Clematis Street generates 40 car trips with 24 employees two bike trips, four train trips, train or bus trips, and 26 walk trips. Way less than the 73 car trips. What can we do with $17,000 or $18,000 in downtown with infrastructure, which is what you have to spend impact fee money on? Bus shelter, 6,000 bucks. Modular bus shelter. Bike rack, 600 bucks. New decorative street lighting, 2,500 bucks per. So do the math on $18,000 and what you could do with that. Now multiply that by a 
10 story office building and a one or $2 million roadway impact fee. And think of the infrastructure enhancement you could do with those numbers on the ground level to improve the quality of the place and facilitate even more mode shift. So it's a virtuous cycle, if that makes sense. So how have we shifted? How have we evolved over time? How am I doing on time, Alyssa, by the way? Time for Q&A. So if you could just finish up soon, that'd be awesome. Here we go. OK. Um, over time, looking back historically, we had in the 1970s, on Clamata Street, using it as an example, 72% of the space for cars, 28% for people, 63% by the 1990s with 37% for people. And today with our curbless configuration, we've crossed that line, 45% allocated to motor vehicles and 55% to people. So we have evolved and gotten better and better. Here's a, just a couple of quick looks. This is the street now. This was on the ribbon cutting day of one of the blocks. This was us in COVID response. Um, many of you may have seen or heard about the dining on the spot program where we worked um, with business owners, the city, um, a, a equipment rental company to allow businesses to spill out into the street. Without the design we have, we would not have been able to do that. We could not have adapted. Just a couple of quick looks at those different configurations of how we allowed this to happen. Um, again, the public realm and the design of the public realm was the only way this could have happened. Some more just quick looks. We'll get to Q&A. The future. This is what we're working on for the future. How much better can we get? Um, and just some design drawings. All credit to Victor Dover and his team and Cheryl Moriente in the DDA office here for coming up with these proposals for how we can even do more to enhance the public realm and entice people to get out of their cars and make it as enjoyable and uh, exquisite an experience as we can. And then just how we've adapted, just some looks at what's happening now. This is the 500 block on the weekends, go check them out. And then finally, just the street level experience. Um, if you haven't been downtown, uh, I invite you to come if you are interested and want to reach out to me, Raphael, at the Downtown Development Authority. I would be more than happy to meet you on the street and go for a walk and talk about how we got here. And with that, I'm ready for questions. Well, thank you so much, Raphael. That was a great presentation. And thank you for all of the attendees for joining us today. Um, I am going to start reading some questions and you can take a stab at it the best you can. So first up, um, are there any or any of these roads downtown maintained by the county or the state? If they are, then how were you able to effectively disregard the transportation model and focus on implementing more multimodal improvements? Um, so, so that's a great question. Um, and we didn't disregard the transportation models. What we did was get a traffic, a transportation concurrency exception. That means that this district was granted a pass on achieving single occupant vehicle level of service standards, but we were required to do all kinds of other things. The trolley is a circulator, walkability enhancements, uh, bikeability enhancements, et cetera, et cetera. So we had to provide, we had to work on creating other capacity to offset the loss of those lanes and the, and the additional growth. Um, that's part of the, the first part of the question. Um, does DOT or county or others maintain roads in downtown? Um, DOT used to have Dixie and Olive and the city had Quadrille. And I, as I understand it, they swapped. So the city could actually do the enhancements they wanted to do to Dixie and Olive, State Road 5, or at least Olive Avenue is State Road 5. And DOT took over Quadrille Boulevard as the bypass. Um, however, this, the city has a maintenance agreement with DOT and DOT has gotten much, much better uh, with context sensitive design and allowing urban districts to make those types of improvements uh, in their downtowns. Thanks. I have a little bit of a shorter one coming up. Uh, is it only Clematis that is curbless or have you tried that on other streets as well? Um, uh, Clematis and Rosemary Square, Rosemary Avenue through um, 
what was City Place, now Rosemary Square, is curbless. Uh, and even outside of the downtown in the Northwest neighborhood, 7th Street is curbless. And there are plans to do other areas uh, of downtown, perhaps Evernia Street, Daytura, um, where you have um, commercial frontage and or residential frontage on those streets. But again, it's, it's where it's most appropriate, where speeds are appropriate and where, those, where the edges are conducive to that. So yes, there are, there's more than just Clematis. How are canopies attached to private properties achieved? Is there a specific process to make this a requirement? Um, uh, like a, an awning, I would guess, off of a building to cover the sidewalk. Um, I'm guessing that's the question. Uh, so those are not a requirement, um, but they are strongly encouraged. Um, it's a permit process uh, and the Downtown Development Authority even has an incentive program we call our facade enhancement program. It's a grant that matches up to $10,000, dollar for dollar up to $10,000 for enhancements to building facades at the ground level. Um, and we strongly encourage awnings where you have pedestrian frontage. So we do all we can to encourage it, but it's not a requirement. Okay, this one's a little longer. Thanks so much for a thorough review of the history of West Palm Beach. The timeline and examples you shared speak to the economic, racial, and system forces that transformed the space over time, displacing businesses and people. How can urban slash public planning and complete streets help us to mitigate the repetition of this history or getting it wrong again? How can urban, uh, sorry, urban and uh, public planning and complete streets ensure that the changes we make remain not only sustainable, but also equitable and just? So that's a big question. Um, I think it hits right on top of gentrification, which is a very challenging issue um, for West Palm Beach, for South Florida, for any place that is seeking to do better. Um, I will say that social justice and equity is definitely one of the motivating factors for me as a professional. Um, I mean, there's, I, I, I could go on, a, on, I could say a lot of, about the issue, but I will say that um, in the past, absolutely there have been, uh, there have been missteps and there have been wrongs. Um, but as we've learned and understood those and coming forward, there is very careful and thoughtful uh, approaches taken to um, doing all we can to avoid that. Most recently, um, the city of West Palm Beach, the, the, the DDA is a small special district, so we play a small role in this stuff. Um, but uh, the city and the CRA in West Palm Beach have started to make some significant investments in affordable housing, incentivizing it uh, in, our, in our urban center, um, uh, working with developers to include that in their projects. And then all of the multimodal enhancements that, that, um, we just, that I discussed uh, and shared today um, are not just for people who we want them to decide to ride or walk or ride a, a train or a bus, but for people whose option that that is. Um, inclusivity is, is very high on the list of uh, outcomes, uh, intended outcomes that we have as a, as a district. Um, and that's thinking not just the people we want to visit our place, the neighborhoods on our edges, but the people who come to work and, and enjoy our downtown every day. Um, we are, we strive to be as inclusive as possible. You spoke about getting the community involved and getting their feedback and ideas. What was your approach to get the most representative samples of the community and how did you get the elderly, the youth and the low income people involved? You, 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 I, I'm a big believer in you have to go to people where they are. Um, you, you have to go down to on the on the street, you have to go to events, you have to reach out to the to the neighborhoods all around you, talk to people on the street. Um, you, you have to go to people where they are, you know, because typically and, and we did that and we do that increasingly. Historically, public input was uh, here's a comment card, fill it out. We're going to hold a couple of meetings here and there. You're invited to come. That misses a lot of people. So we try to take a broad approach online. There's a website, there's a survey, there's an email address. There, there are public meetings and not just at City Hall, 
in the neighborhood. We will go to you and talk to you where you are. We will go to the green market and engage people on the street there. We'll talk to the people that are coming to work in downtown every day um, to gauge their input and understand their needs. Um, so yes, just like the issue of inclusivity and, and being cautious about gentrification, the public input process has evolved as well as, as we, as the public sector have become more understanding and aware of the fact that we have missed many, many times missed in the past um, engaging the people that we really need to hear from. I just want to remind everyone that we, you can continue submitting questions. We have about five minutes left uh, to answer. So if you have anything else, please message or submit them in the chat. In the meantime, Raphael, how do you anticipate the city will continue to grow in the next couple of years, given your history being with the DDA for 14? Um, definitely there's a big demand for residential, uh, multifamily residential in urban centers. Um, we are seeing a lot of people coming from the Northeast, from the Midwest. Um, COVID is maybe a big reason. I don't know that how long that trend will continue, but we're seeing a significant increase in, in, uh, uh, people coming in from out of the state. Um, and then. Uh, people that want proximity to jobs, people that want proximity to cultural amenities, cafes, shops, walkability, um, definitely an increased demand for living in downtown. And we're seeing that in the form of new residential projects coming out of the ground uh, right now. We're definitely also seeing a demand, a surprising demand for uh, office space. And we have uh, two class A office buildings on the way or well underway out of the ground and others on the drawing board um, so yes, in summary, I see continued growth for downtown, um, both in the residential and non-residential areas. Um, and even as a destination for tourism and visitation for people that just want to come and spend mm -hmm. time in the place. We have um, hotel rooms, you know, new hotel rooms on the horizon. And, uh, you know, I'm very eager to see those come out of the ground because that puts a whole different spin on things. You know, it's great for our businesses. It's great for the, for the public space to have people that just want to be here and enjoy themselves. Great, and I think we have time for one more question. In recent years, the downtown has seen growth in development without seeing growth in traffic. Do you think that is it's possible to continue that trend moving forward? Um, well, we're going to still see growth in traffic. I mean, you know, we're going to still we're going to continue to see growth in traffic, even though it might not um, hit that you know that projected threshold from a trip generation model perspective. Um, it's been much less than was anticipated, but it, it will continue to grow. Um, I think the more mixed use and the denser we get, the better, the better we can deal with, um, you know, everyone's heard the term, uh, internal trip capture. I'm assuming most people have heard that phrase internal trip capture, the more mixed use and the more denser place becomes the, uh, less need there is to drive everywhere. And yes, people will always have to drive in here from outside, um, but uh, I feel like we have more than adequate roadway capacity to deal with those, the, the uh, marginal growth that we're gonna see. And we also have what seems like an increasing uh, will and capacity to provide more options, multimodal options to let people come to and leave our downtown district. So I'm hopeful that we're gonna continue to grow and we're gonna also continue to make more and more of a shift toward those multimodal options. Okay, great. Um, I do have one more question that keeps popping in and this can be the last one. Um, how has micro mobility and the new train service affected downtown? Uh, the new train service, I assume that's uh, Brightline. Um, Brightline is a boon for this downtown and every downtown it has a stop in and there will be others. I think Boca is next, maybe Gardens. Um, so Brightline's great. Um, it's long overdue. Uh, Tri-Rail is great as well. Our, our, our Tri-Rail stop in downtown is the second busiest on the entire corridor, or at least historically it's been second to Miami Metro Rail Transfer Station. About three or 4,000 people a day get off Tri-Rail in downtown. Brightline's ridership was growing steadily um, 
However, they've paused service. So everyone, the, them and, and us, the stakeholder group here are very eager for them to resume service, particularly when they connect to Orlando. And I do envision that as being a major amenity, particularly for workforce and um, cultural visitation, et cetera. Micro mobility um, hasn't yet really impacted our downtown. We had a bike share program for a couple of years um, that the intent was always that that was going to expand well beyond the downtown. The DDA procured that bike share program, Skybike originally. Um, the city uh, pursued a larger, um, uh, an RFP for a much larger system. And uh, the, the company that owns Skybike opted to not pursue that RFP. Um, it was awarded to a company, to Bird, um, and Skybike pulled all their stuff out, waiting for Bird to arrive, and bam, oh, COVID hit. So nobody really knows what's going to happen with micromobility. Um, it's, right now, it's a little bit up in the air. I see some scooters zipping around now and then, but we are very eager to get toward, get bike share back. I'm not a huge fan of scooters, to be honest. Um, I don't think that they're a value add for a place like downtown. Maybe I'm in the minority, but um, I'd like to see something different. I'll just leave it at that. Great, thanks so much, Raphael, for all your questions, answers, the presentation, everything. And thank you to everyone who helped put you know, today and tomorrow together. And thank you for joining us. Um, so there is a link to the evaluation form in the chat box. Please take a minute to share your thoughts on today's session. Additionally, there's also a link to the Safe Street Summit People's Choice Award, where you can cast your vote for your favorite Complete Streets, com complete streets efforts in Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties. They're the same link, actually. So thank you, and I hope you I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference today and tomorrow. So bye-bye.